Well, over the last several weeks, we have been asking and encouraging you to invest your life sowing into the kingdom of God. Jesus told us that the kingdom of God is like a treasure that is buried in a field. And the man went and found the treasure. And when he found it, he went out and sold all that he had, everything that he owned, uh, in order that he might go and buy that field and ultimately possess that treasure, which was greater than any other thing. The reason that we would tell you to invest your life into the kingdom of God is because in Christ Jesus, what we have in him, the riches that we possess in Jesus Christ are greater than anything that this world has to offer. Now, we've given you kind of this guiding illustration of the Dust Bowl era farmers who found themselves in the late 1930s down to their last little bit of wheat seed. And they had to make a decision between eating, uh, feeding their family with what they had left, what little seed they had left, or taking that seed and sowing it into their fields. And in a similar way, you and I, we only have so much time. There's only so much energy. We only have so many resources, and we have a decision to make. Where will we sow what God has given us? Where will we invest the time that we have left or the resources that God has entrusted to us? Will we sow them into the field in hope of receiving a harvest, or will we invest them elsewhere? Will we consume what God has given to us, think it's about us and for us, and ultimately never see a harvest because we never ultimately sowed what God had given to us? Now, over the last several weeks, uh, we've asked you to invest your life into the kingdom of God in, in a few different ways. The first way was by devoting yourself daily to Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm the vine and you're the branches. If you will abide in me and I in you, then your life will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. And so we said, devote yourselves daily. Make this your daily priority to give yourself to Jesus, to walk with him in his word and in prayer throughout your entire day. That's practice number one. Practice number two is to gather consistently with the body of Jesus Christ, with this church. That, you, that, that would be the first priority on your schedule. Like, Sunday is the day that I set aside for worship. I'm going to gather with the body. We're going to sing, and we're going to listen to the word preached, and we're going to bring our gifts to bear. And I'm not just going to be here as a consumer of what the, the church staff or the, the volunteers have to offer, but I'm going to be here as a contributor. I'm going to show up early, and I'm going to invest my life in the people. I'm going to be there, and I'm going to smile, and I'm going to connect. I'm going to encourage with the men and women who come through these doors because I need the church, and the church needs me. So devote daily, gather consistently. The third thing that we ask you to give your life to is to walking in community alongside other believers, that you would develop and pursue deep, rich, abiding relationships with other believers in this church who will lock arms with you and say, we're going to pursue Jesus Christ together. I'm going to get to know you, and you're going to get to know me. And no matter what happens, and if you fall down, I'm going to pick you up. And if I fall down, I'm going to depend upon you to pick me up. But we are going to follow Jesus Christ together. Together. And so we do life closely with other believers in Jesus Christ who are chasing after him just like we are. We devote daily, we gather consistently, we commit to community. And last week we heard Randall, our chairman of deacons, talk about serving faithfully. And we understand that within every single believer, the Holy Spirit has given you spiritual gifts to invest, to sow into the kingdom of God. Now, if we get so busy with all of the things that this world has to offer, and listen, y'all, I got three kids, and there's a lot of things that the world has to offer. We can be so busy doing everything else that we never set aside time to serve and to use our gifts to build up the church and to seek the kingdom of God. And so we invest our time and our gifts into the kingdom of God, that the church might be built up and that the lost might come to know Jesus Christ. Now today, I'm going to talk to you about the topic that I know that you've been awaiting since day one. When we started talking about sowing into the kingdom of God, you're like, man, I need to know what week he's going to talk about giving because I'm just excited to hear that. Like, I just want to be encouraged in that. I, I realize I probably need to give way more. Like, I'm just looking forward to this week. Now, if, if that's not you, um, my apologies. Uh, it is what it is. Now, I, I do want to take just a minute and say this. If you've been in the church 
Maybe that's all they seem to talk about every single week. It's give and give and give and give, right? Or they're uh, constantly manipulative or trying to guilt you all the time into giving money. Uh, you've been in a church that was all about their church, right? Just building up the organization and having nice things, right? That, um, if that's you, and this is hard to hear, uh, I just want to invite you to, to lean in and to listen. Today, we're going to look at what the Word of God has to say about giving and money. And, and as a matter of fact, if, if it's going to make it like impossible for you to listen, uh, if, if the, the fact that we might ask you for money at the end of this, uh, here, here's what I want to just say to you. Um, you're free. Like, you don't have to give your money here. When you see what the scriptures say about money and about giving, um, you don't have to give your money here. If you need to give it somewhere else because you're afraid that, you know, we're just trying to manipulate you or whatever, here's what I would just ask you to do that commit to following Jesus and to walking in obedience to his word with your finances, whether you do it here or elsewhere. Now, I believe this is a great place to invest what God has given to you. I'm going to ask our members and, and, and believers here to do just that. Um, but if it's going to make it to where you can't hear uh, that we would ask you to give money here, then I would just set you free to give your money somewhere else. Don't disobey what the word says, uh, but you don't have to give your money here. Now, the reason that we talk about money in the church and the reason that it's important for us to do so is because there's perhaps nothing else in all of life that will compete for your trust and your devotion, your attention, and your affections. Nothing in your life will compete with God quite like money will for those things. And whether we, we like it or not, uh, it's just something that is inherent in the world that we live in. Uh, money is something that competes with God for our trust and our attention and our affection and devotion. That we can easily come to trust in money rather than trusting in God to provide for us, to protect us, to keep us safe. And so the scriptures have a great deal to say about how we should handle money, how we should think about money money. Today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. If you want to go ahead and turn there, we're going to begin in verse 19. And here's what Jesus says to us. This is his inaugural sermon uh, as he begins his earthly ministry. He goes up on the mountain and he sits down and begins to teach the people. One of the things he chose to talk about in sermon number one was money. Here's what he says in Matthew chapter 6 verse 19. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, the fact that Jesus began by telling us what not to do with our money suggests that your default, whether we want to acknowledge this or not, my default, that apart from Jesus and his teaching, what the average person will do is to sow our money to accumulate treasures around ourselves. Now, treasures look different for different people. Uh, some people, you know, you're all about clothes. You got to look good to feel good, right? And so, and you're going to chase after some of those, those luxurious items. You need the accessories and you need the stuff, right? And we'll accumulate those things and it's never enough. Now, if you're not a clothes person, fellas, maybe it's tools and maybe it's toys, right? We, we just continue to accumulate the things that we think that we need in our lives, the things that we value and the things that we treasure. But ultimately, here's what we do. When we're gathering up treasures on, here on earth for ourselves, um, what we're doing is we're building our own little castle. We're building our own little kingdom. These are the things that make me feel happy or safe or secure, right? So we build our own little castle, our own little kingdom. And right here inside of my kingdom, my family's got everything they're going to need. I've got everything I'm going to need. And ultimately, we have everything we need or we believe that we have everything that we need apart from God. I've got plenty of money. Kids will be able to go to college. Man, retirement's taken care of. I've got all the tools that I need to accomplish, everything that I need to accomplish. My future is assured. My safety is assured. Our own little castle, our own little kingdom. The problem with that line of thinking is that worldly treasures can never provide what they ultimately promise. 
As a matter of fact, if you look down just a few verses later, Jesus in verse 25, he tells us what the product of storing up earthly treasures is going to produce for us. It's anxiety, it's fear, and it's worry. The problem with worldly treasures is that they're fleeting. They're here today and they're gone tomorrow. Moths and rust destroy. Thieves break in and steal. And our more modern economy, inflation happens. Markets crash. Layoffs happen. And suddenly the things that we thought could provide happiness or security or safety or the things that we've longed for in this life, they can't. They don't deliver what they ultimately promise. Jesus says in verse 25, Therefore I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, and don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or about your body, what you're going to put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his glory was arrayed like one of those. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? It's an interesting indictment. That when we're worried about our lives, about our clothes, food, drink, the necessities, the things, when we're worried about those things, it actually shows that we're not operating in faith. When we attempt to surround ourselves with earthly treasures to try to provide that security, that safety, that satisfaction, that happiness, it's ultimately a lack of faith in God. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek after all of these things, but your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. So for us, don't store up for yourselves treasure here on this earth, where moth and rust destroy, thieves break in and steal. And that shouldn't be our approach to life. We shouldn't invest our money trying to surround ourselves with the comforts and the pleasures of this life. Instead, Jesus gives us another way in verse 20. This should be your pursuit. You want to know the kingdom of God. You want to know the riches of this life. You want to know fullness of life in God's kingdom. Verse 20, he says, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That as believers in Jesus Christ, who who know Jesus, He is our Lord, who see what He teaches in His Word, we shouldn't be like the rest of the world. We shouldn't be gathering up for ourselves, storing up, accumulating more and more things, at least not here on this earth. But instead, we should be sowing our money into the kingdom of God and seeking to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. It's, a, it's quite a different approach from, from uh, treasures here on this earth. The treasures that we see in heaven are not things that we touch with our, our hands and always see with our eyes. Um, it's in a totally different place. The good news about treasures stored up in heaven is they're extraordinarily safe. Moth and rust don't destroy. Thieves don't break in and steal. Um, The investments that we make into God's kingdom are 100% safe. They're certain. And when we trust in God, when we entrust our treasure to Him, sowing our treasure into His kingdom, seeking the kingdom of God, the, the thing that is greater than every other thing, God promises to take care of us. Look down in verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. That when we choose to trust God first, 
When we choose to sow our treasure into God's kingdom, to store up treasure, not here on this earth, but in heaven, God promises that thing that you're worried about, thing that's made your heart anxious, it will be added to you. If you will seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, God will take care of you. He's, he's a good father. And in the same way that as a, as a dad, and I'm an imperfect father, but with my kids, that I, I would do anything that I had to do to make sure that they had food on the table and clothes to wear and all of the things that they need in their life. The God of the universe who spoke all that we know and see into existence, who, who created everything by His word out of nothing, He invites us to trust Him with our treasure and to trust Him to take care of every single need that we have. God knows your name and He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows what you need and He's inviting us to trust Him. Hey, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all of those things I'm going to take care of for you. It's when we take these steps of faith and trust in God that we come to know Him and know who He is. We come to know the nature and the character and the love of our Heavenly Father. When God comes through for us, when we couldn't have come through for ourselves, we come to know Him more fully. And that's a relationship with God. For many of us, and we just store up treasures. And if something were to go wrong, we've got to make sure we've got plenty of money here, plenty of money there. God's like, hey, hey, don't, don't worry about those things. And don't store up for yourselves treasures here on this earth. And entrust yourself to your Heavenly Father. And watch how I take care of you. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all of these things will be added to you. In verse 24, he tells us something that's really important for us to understand. He says, no one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Your heart, this is true for you specifically, put your name in the blank here, right? Your heart will be devoted to and trust in either God or money, but not both. Can I ask you a question? If we were to open up your checkbook or see your spending and in, in, in your priorities and your finances, uh, which does it say that you trust? Would your giving and spending say, no, 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 I trust God to provide for me? Or does it say that we trust in money? To provide the things that our souls and our hearts long for. Today, I'm going to invite you to begin trusting God with your money. To sow your treasure into God's kingdom. To invest on a consistent basis as the first thing that you do with your money every week or when you get paid. That you would invest into God's kingdom. To put at risk what God places in your hands, to put at risk the seed that God has given to you, rather than consuming it or storing it up, to sow it into God's kingdom and to ask Him to produce a harvest, to bear good fruit through you and through the seeds that you sow in this world. And here's the beauty of it. As you sow your treasure into God's kingdom and you begin to invest there, your heart follows it you will come to know God more and to love God more. You will grow in your devotion to God. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So sowing it into God's kingdom. There's a story that's in all four of the Gospels. It's of the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. You've probably heard it if you've been around church very long. If you're new and you, you, you haven't read much of the Scriptures, it's, it's the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. Jesus has been out teaching about the kingdom of God, inviting men and women to follow Him. He's been healing the sick, and enormous crowds were following. Uh, the crowds on this particular day, uh, they designate there were 5,000 men in addition 
addition to women and children. So we don't know just how big the crowd was, but it was a big crowd. I've never preached to that many people in my life. I don't know how Jesus did it without amplification, uh, but huge crowds following Jesus wherever he went. And it starts to get late at night, and his, his disciples are like, hey, Jesus, I think those people are getting hungry. We know they were really the ones that were hungry, but at least they're, you know, I'm trying to sound spiritual. Jesus, we should send the people away so they can get something to eat. And Jesus turns to him and he says, you give them something to eat. Now, oh, that was an impossible task. I mean, you think 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 people to feed that many people even with like all of our modern conveniences and Walmart down the street, like that would be quite a challenge. But for them, they're in a remote place. And they look around and all they have are five loaves and two fish. There was a boy there whose mother likely packed his lunch for them. We're not told all the circumstances, but he had five small barley loaves and two fish. And he was like, hey, Here's what I have. And so that, that, that was the extent of what they had to accomplish what Jesus had called them to, which was to give all of these people something to eat. It must have felt impossible. So they brought what they had to Jesus. Five small barley loaves and two fish. And Jesus took it. And he blessed it. And he told them to have the crowd sit down on the grass. And they began to distribute the five loaves and the two fish. And the scriptures tell us in all four Gospels that everyone in the crowd ate until they were full. Now, when they had estimated what it would take for everyone in the crowd to have just a little, it would have taken over more than 200 days' wages just for everyone to have a little. And yet, from five loaves and two fish, everyone ate until they were full and they picked up 12 baskets full of leftovers. Jesus performed a miracle on that day, an extraordinary miracle in the midst of what felt like an impossible task. Church for us, his church, his disciples, Jesus has given us what feels like an impossible task. As we look out across our world, we hear the words of the Great Commission spoken over us. I want you to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Y'all, I've been trying to teach my kids to obey, my three kids in my home, um, even part of the stuff that I have commanded. And listen, it's quite a challenge. And yet Jesus says, go and make disciples of all the nations. And as we hear him commission us to do that, it feels impossible. And yet, what we're going to do is we're going to take what God has given us. Men and women here in LaFleur County, a lot of people think about where we live and they kind of shake their head, right? Who are those people? They're not educated, their standard of living's pretty low feel like we don't have much to offer. We're kind of like that little boy. But what I'm asking you to do is to offer God what you have. To place what we have into the hands of God and say, God, would you do something miraculous here? We too want to see the disciples made both here and around the world. So God, would you take what we have and would you multiply that? And would you do a great work? Church, we... There's about 700 people who are connected to our church who are, you know, attend on a somewhat regular basis. And just to begin to think about how to care for and disciple and to teach and to equip and to train and serve and all the things that we need to do, and it's huge. Within a 15-mile radius of this building, there are 50,000 people that need to know who Jesus is and need to be taught to obey everything that He's commanded. You broaden that out to our state and our country, and around the world, we're talking in the billions. So what we're going to do is exactly what God has called us to do. And we're going to invest in the places that God has called us to invest. And we know there's about 650 students in the high school here. 
They need to know about Jesus. And so we invest in student ministry here and at our Pecola campus. And kids in, in the elementary schools all around, that's, that's just Poto, by the way. There's several schools here. 50,000 people within a 15-mile radius that we need to get busy and we need to disciple. And we're going to invest in that as a church. That's what we're about. If you want to know who Cross Community is, we're a church that's committed to being and making disciples. And that's kind of the end. That's what we're about. But beyond that, God has called us to send missionaries, to invest in missionaries. We have on the campuses of uh, the universities around the Oklahoma City metro area there, University of Central Oklahoma, OU, OSU, through STUMO, we get to invest there. Devin Huddleston is a missionary, and she's serving faithfully, discipling young people. We have an opportunity to send some of our students who are in this church on mission trips. They're connected to the BCM at Carl Albert in, in our city. We want to help send them. Uh, we're supporting a missionary who serves the European theater, uh, another church that's in South America, a Lego LBN church that we get to be a support to. We have missionaries in northern Africa. We're going to do everything that we can to make disciples both here and abroad because that's what Jesus has called us to. Um, this next year, we're going to be partnering with Lego LBN uh, out of Venezuela, um, Antonio Correa and his wife, Daniela, and we're going to partner with them to plant a new church in Madrid, Spain. There are about 200,000 Venezuelan refugees who have left Venezuela due to the economic and political conditions there, and they now live within Spain. The majority of those live in Madrid. And God's been, or Antonio has been feeling God leading him for quite some time to go and to plant a church in Madrid. And we get to come alongside them and partner with them in that. Now, that's probably going to cost us, I don't know exactly, and I'm thinking fifty dollars to $60,000 over the next year to help them get that church started and to invest there. So I'm going to ask you to give sacrificially. As Antonio leaves his church there in Guinari, Venezuela, Lego LBN, there's a new pastor coming in. His name is Augusto. He helped Antonio plant that church more than 10 years ago. He has served there. He's a godly man who's going to lead well, uh, but they still have needs, and we want to remain committed to helping them. Um, to be honest with you, economically, their things are still absolutely dismal. There are people who are going hungry. They're going to live on a little bit of rice and beans every day. Uh, we have a chance to continue to, to serve there. I got a, a phone call, or actually it was a WhatsApp, this, this weekend. And Antonio said, hey, before I leave this church and I go plant the new one, there's a few things I'm just going to ask you guys to pray about if you could help with. And he said, we have so many people who are coming to our church. Um, he said, we need 100 new chairs. And we need somebody to, to help us just to be able to afford chairs. They've actually been hauling chairs on the back of a motorcycle from several different places in their city just so that their people at their church can have a place to sit. Absolutely, we'll help with that. He so said, we need a place to, to house students, maybe to renovate a little bit of space or to rent somewhere. We have about 100 students who are coming who need a place to meet. Absolutely, we have a chance to make disciples there. We're going to be about it. Church, God has called us to much. We have so many opportunities to sow our treasure, not into surrounding ourselves with earthly things, but to invest in the kingdom of God. So I'm going to invite you guys to begin giving sacrificially right alongside the other members of this church that we can support mission work right here in our city, students in our schools, adults in our community, college students here in, in the Oklahoma City metro area, support churches here in the United States, and mission work around the globe. For us as a church, we've raised about $325,000 uh, that we need to go toward our parking lot, and we have about $225,000 more that we need that we could accomplish that by the end of this summer, which is kind of the window that we have to do it before the weather gets so bad. So again, I'm going to ask you to begin praying. Hey, God, what would you have me give? What would it look like for me and my family to give sacrificially? And I have just two things that I want to ask you to consider uh, as you're praying through. Hey, God, what would you have me give? Um, number one, how much should you give? Um, some of you uh, 
And this is a difficult time for you financially. And I, I get it. I mean, inflation has happened. And it hits poorer communities very hard. We feel that. And maybe for you, you're thinking, man, I don't have anything to give. What I have to give is so insignificant, it could never help anyone anywhere. As you think about the little boy in the story, he really didn't have very much to give. It's a crowd of probably 15,000 people that needed to eat. And he had enough for one small boy. It was a piddly amount. 200 days worth of wages wouldn't have fed all those people. But he offered God what he had. And what he had in the hands of Jesus was more than enough. And so I would argue, as you pray about what God would have you give, I would want you to know that no gift is too small. Because God is a miracle worker. God takes what we give him and he multiplies that. Uh, the Old Testament law uh, prescribed 10%. That's what you were to give. You had to bring 10% of your first fruits of the harvest. You'd bring it into the temple. And, and that's kind of how things function. But in John chapter 13, 34, we're no longer under the old covenant, the Old Testament law. Jesus told us a new commandment. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. So you are also to love one another. The, the new standard for our giving is not 10% a tithe based upon Old Testament law. The new standard for our giving is to love our brother and sister as Jesus Christ has loved us. And our reminder is that Jesus Christ offered his life on the cross. He suffered and bled and died that we might be reconciled to God and to enjoy a relationship with him. When we think about our giving it's not, oh, I've got to hit this level to think that I've attained the law. Uh, but rather, our example is giving our very lives. So would you pray about what God would have you give and give sacrificially, sowing your treasure into the kingdom of God, seeking first his kingdom and trusting that all of these things will be provided for you? I'm going to ask that as you pray that you would say 10% is the floor. That's where we're going to start. And maybe God wants you to give quite a bit more, and possibly God wants, wants you to give less. But just know that there is no gift that is too small, and there is no gift that's too large. When you think about that young boy on that day, he didn't give a ton, but he gave all that he had. And he gave it all knowing that if Jesus doesn't do something, I'm not going to eat today. And even if God would lead you to give all that you have, I believe that God would take care of you. That boy ate until he was satisfied and there were 12 baskets full left over. If he still would have wanted more, he could have eaten more. So there's no gift that's too big or no gift too small. I would ask you to pray about starting at 10% and then going up from there. So that's number one, how much should you give? Uh, number two, uh, it really regards the timing of your gift. When should you give? There's a lot of people that you start thinking about giving and you think, well, I'll tell you what, um, God, if you will multiply what I have, man, I'll start sowing into your kingdom. I will give and I will bless people. If you'll just give me more, multiply what I have, then just watch what I can do. But you know, that's not how God works. Do you know when the miracle of multiplication happened in the story of the five loaves and two fish? It happened after the little boy had transferred everything he had into the hands of Jesus. When he released what he had and he placed it in the hands of God, Jesus performed the miracle. Multiplication doesn't happen when it's in our hands. It happens when it's in the hands of Jesus. In the same way that if we have seed in our hands and we just keep it there, it's not going to grow. Um, we have to sow it into the field if we want to see it grow and multiply. And so God has called us to an extraordinary task. Many people are waiting, hey God, would you just give me the resources that I could accomplish that? I would want you to know that God already has. He's given us exactly what he wants us to give, and he's the one that takes it and multiplies it to, you know, billions of people. The, the mission that he has for his people, he's got it. He just wants us to trust him. So when do we give? Um, the tithe in the Old Testament was given of the first fruits. What Jesus invites us to do in the, the Sermon on the Mount is to seek first the kingdom of God. And so here's my challenge. As you pray about how much you want to give, that you would make this the first line item in your budget. 
You say, I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God. Rather than giving God what's left over at the end of the month, that you would say, I'm going to give to God first. And I'm going to sow into his kingdom. Above all other things, I'm going to trust that even if there's not enough money, that God is going to take care of me. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, this is Old Covenant, I recognize, but God gave the people a challenge. He said, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down a blessing until there is no more need. I believe that we can put God to the same test today. That we give him our first fruits. We sow into his kingdom first. And we can trust that he will meet every single one of our needs. Now, if you're here today and you aren't a believer in Jesus Christ, you don't know Christ, uh, I want you to know that I'm not asking you to give anything. As a matter of fact, uh, today, I want to invite you to receive something from God. I want you to know that Jesus Christ died on the cross to make an atoning sacrifice for your sins that you might enjoy a relationship with him. Where sin once separated you from God, Jesus died to take that sin away that you might have a relationship with the God of the universe. And so if you're not a believer here today, I'm not asking you to give anything. I'm asking you to receive. If you are a believer here today who has received the ultimate gift God sending His one and only Son that you might find new life in Him, I'm going to ask you to pray about giving and giving sacrificially, sowing your treasure into the kingdom of God and trusting that God will take care of you. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank You that You are a good Father, that You enjoy to give good gifts to Your children, that You are the God who provides you're the God who creates something out of nothing. You speak things into existence. You're the God who loves us and who offered your one and only Son that we might find life. Lord, I pray that we would follow your example in giving sacrificially. I pray that we would sow our treasure into your kingdom, seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness and trusting that all these things will be added to us. Lord, as we think about what you've called us to as a church, the needs that we see around us here locally, across our nation and abroad, Father, it feels overwhelming. But you're the God who performs miracles. You take the small things that we give and you multiply them to accomplish all of your purposes and you do so for your glory. Father, we praise you and we thank you. We invite you to work in our midst. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.